afternoon and good evening wherever you're tuning from around the world. Welcome and selamat datang to our 2021 Global Happiness Forum as we celebrate International Day of Happiness. Are you happy? Because I for one am very happy and excited for our forum today. Before we start, please note that we are recording this session for our university archives. If you do have any objections, please let the moderators know through the chat. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers today where each one of them will be presenting their own view on happiness, sharing tips to help you lead a happier, more fulfilling life. I am Farish and I will be your MC for part one of this forum today. We also have some fantastic prizes for you to win and we will be running the competition at the end of the speaker session, so please stay tuned. Before we move on, please take note of the housekeeping rules at the top of the chat box, especially in regards to claiming your CPD hours. If you do have any questions or inquiries, please type it in the chat and our moderators will tend to your questions. We also will have two Q&A sessions at the end of part one and two of the forum. So please also type in your questions for the speakers in the chat box. With that out of the way, allow me to introduce our Provost and CEO, Professor Mushtaq Al-Atabi. He's initiated a number of programs at Harriet Watt University, Malaysia, using the positive education approach and are now being adopted across our global footprint. I'm very delighted to welcome Professor Mushtaq, who will be introducing our event today. Dear friends, speakers, guests, and colleagues, welcome to our Global Happiness Forum. The International Day of Happiness is a United Nations initiative to recognize the importance of happiness in the lives of people around the world. Since 2017, Harriet Watt University Malaysia organized the Happiness Forum on this day, and it has been going from strength to strength. But what do we mean when we say happiness? What does happiness really mean? Happiness is not only about positive or pleasant emotions, but also life satisfaction, deep sense of meaning, flourishing and well-being. And while we cannot control what life throws at us, we can often control the way we, we respond to that. We are not proposing here that choosing to respond positively to a difficult life challenge to be an easy choice to make. Quite the contrary. Often choosing to be happy and positive is the more difficult choice to be made and to be made every day. To an extent, this is a skill that can be developed and a mindset that can be cultivated with intentional practice. We also recognize that it's not realistic to expect to be, to be happy all of the time. However, positive emotions build resources that help us to overcome unexpected adversities. In fact, research has shown that optimism, which is believing in a better future, is one of the key ingredients to being resilient. Optimism might very well be kind of the engine of resilience. It gives us the attitude to continue to persist. Part of optimism is being able to separate what we can control in the situation from the aspects of the situation we might need to accept. Resilient individuals think about stresses not as threats, but rather as challenges and even as opportunities to grow. Today, we celebrate the International Day of Happiness while the world still deals with COVID-19 pandemic. Thinking of our students who are getting ready to join university and their parents, we chose the theme of today's forum, Starting Smart at University. Youth and their parents have been dealing with a number of challenges, including studying online, not being able to spend time with friends, delays in exams, financial and mental health issues, and many others. And our speakers 
are going to touch on topics that will inform how you think about these stresses and will offer you practical advice. They will reveal some of the latest scientific understanding of happiness, share tips on how to live a happier life, inspire you to try out something new, describe how to beat some of the stresses facing students in school, college and university, and explain how applying principles of positive education cultivates a learning environment that enables students to flourish despite the challenges of coping with the current pandemic. At Heritwat University Malaysia, we define ourselves as being a caring community. We promote opportunities for students and staff that lead to positive emotions and in turn develop greater well-being and resilience. The Happier You is our signature initiative that is aimed at promoting the 10 keys to a happier living. These are giving, relating, exercising, awareness, trying out direction, resilience, positive emotions, acceptance, and meaning. As we face a global crisis together, let's find positive ways to look after ourselves and each other. At the end, I wish to thank our speakers, the organizing committee for this forum, and all of you who chose to be with us today. I wish us all a successful forum and a happy International Day of Happiness. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Mushtaq, for your very welcoming words and introduction. Now, let us welcome our first invited speaker all the way from the UK. Vanessa King is Head of Psychology and Workplaces, a board member at Action for Happiness, and the author of the book, 10 Keys to Happier Living. As a speaker, of course, she is very much in demand in the UK and elsewhere. So we're very delighted that she has taken time out of her hectic schedule to talk to us on International Day of Happiness. Over to you, Vanessa. Can you share my slides, please? So I was just saying um, that I've had some really fantastic times in Malaysia. So it's really great to be here. Um, I love Malaysian food and I love kind of Malaysian, the, the Malaysian people and the culture. And I um, actually learned to dive in Malaysia. So it's nice to see you've got a presentation from um, Dive Park coming later. So I'm going to talk, um, take you very quickly as a taster through the 10 keys to happier living that Professor Mushtaq um, shared and, um, and tell you a little bit about Action for Happiness, which is one of the charities um, this forum is supporting. So Action for Happiness is a, um, um, I can yeah, show my uh, slides. Can I get the next slide, please? Like, is um, Action for Happiness is a charity and a, a social movement. And it was founded, curiously, by one of the world's leading economists, Professor um, Lord Richard Layard, and also a leading educationist in the UK, Sir Anthony Seldon. So why? Well, uh, well Richard, from Richard's work, he has shown that um, we are richer, it might not always feel like it, but on average, we're richer than at any point in history. We actually, most of us have more. But when we look at data around life satisfaction and other measures of, of well-being, we're actually no happier. And it's like we're, you know, we're bombarded by images from the media, um, et cetera, about what makes for a happy life um, we're, uh, or what makes for a perfect life. But it's um, those things don't seem to be making us any happy because we know mental ill health is rising. Can I get the next slide, please? Um, it's like with you know, as being you know getting into the rat race, we've forgotten what it means to be part of the human race, to what we as human beings need to feel good and function well to really flourish. Next slide, please. Um, and. What's enabled Action for Happiness to take as much as the clues in the name, taking action, 
is a, an ex increasing body of scientific research, or all, um, all our ideas are based on science, that um, are increasingly looking at what does it mean to live a happy life? What enables us to flourish? Um, and how do we learn and apply those skills in our own life? So could we take the next slide, please? But first, let's step back a little bit and think about what, what do we mean by happiness? I was very uh, pleased to hear Professor Mushtaq talking about this, because when we talk about happiness, there's lots thrown around, you know, you know um, we get the next gadget, that's going to make us happy. We're going to go on a fantastic holiday to Malaysia, which does make you happy. Um, um, but actually, happiness is a lot more, there's a lot more to happiness than meets the eye. It's a sense of fulfillment. It's a sense of living a good life. Uh, living the best of our, making the best of our potential. And we need a mixture of the two, because actually working towards fulfill, fulfillment in life, good relationships, doing our best at university, at work, etc., making the most of our potential, doesn't always feel good. It's quite hard. There are challenges, as Professor Mushtaq said. So actually some of the kind of, the, the, the fleeting moments of happiness, the moments of pleasure can help us go along the way. We're going to look about that a little bit later. Can we, next slide, please. So the other question is, uh, often when we're talking about happiness, is does happiness really matter? Does it really matter? Can, next slide, please. Um, well, actually, there's a growing body of research that actually happiness is not just an output of things going well. It seems to be an input to it. For example, we know people who are happier tend to be healthier. They're likely to live longer. They're less likely to catch a cold. They're less likely to have heart disease. Next slide, please. And uh, thinking about performance, we know that people who are happier at work are more productive. Doctors who are happier, faster, and more accurate diagnoses. The, sh the, sh um, the stock returns of companies um, that pay attention to this stuff outperform their, their peers on the stock market. And for students, we know that students' emotional and social skills um, really um, count for more than academic success in terms of their fulfillment um, as adults. Academic success, of course, is associated with life satisfaction um, as adults, but social and emotional skills count too. So next slide, please. And beyond that, there are societal benefits. We know that happier people tend to help others more. They're more responsible and active citizens. So happiness is not just a nice to have. It's actually an ingredient, perhaps a really key ingredient in the sorts of lives we want to live and that we want the sort of societies that we want to be part of. Next slide, please. But then the question is, can we change how happy we are? Can we really do that? Aren't you born kind of glass half full or glass half empty? Well, science, next slide, please. Science is showing that actually we can. Of course, there are, you know, we have our kind of genetic inheritance and early upbringing, which is hard to change, kind of hard to change your parents. Um, our circumstances can play a role, but once our basic needs are met, somewhere safe to live, enough food to pay the bills, um, actually our circumstances play less of a role than we might think. But our choices and behaviours, our habits and practices of thinking and doing really are the things that are most within our control and research shows that we can train our brains, we can learn those skills and habits to be happier. So the question is, next slide please, what makes a difference? I'm really working this, the slide team here. Next slide please. <laughs> so this is where the 10 keys to happier living came in. So when Action for Happiness was formed, um, and it, we're just coming up to our 10 year anniversary, I was involved, I've just come out of my MAP degree at University of Pennsylvania. Um, um, and um, Richard was starting this this new charity and said, well, what, you know, what is action for happiness? What actions should we tell? What actions does the science show people should take? So I spent a lot of time, six months, in fact, diving through all the research, thousands and thousands and thousands of academic studies to come up with the areas that science shows that are within our control and really make most difference on how happy we feel. So um, uh, the 10 keys, you'll notice that some of them are factors, are things that we do in the outside world that affect how we feel on the inside. And others, particularly the, um, the right-hand um, factors five, 
a more sort of internal habits and practices of thinking um, that affect how we are on the outside world. So, um, so it's the inner and outer model of happiness, if you like. And it's really important to note that this is a menu, it's not a prescription. Different people need different things at different, and we need different things at different times. But it can work as a checklist too. And what am I doing already? And what are areas that I could, um, that I can um, perhaps try out? So we're going to have a look at these in a little bit more, more detail. Can I have the, the next slide? So I thought we'd dip into awareness. And I think we do a little quick experiment. So why don't you say, wherever you are right now, I can't see the audience. I know there's uh, hundreds of people there. Put your feet, put your feet on the ground, feel your feet on the ground, feel them really connecting with that earth or the floorboards or the tiles beneath you. Now take a big breath in and a big breath out. You can close your eyes for a moment if you want. Just take a few deep breaths in, really focusing on your breath, particularly the out breath. Now, notice how you feel as a result of that. Just a few moments, a few seconds of pausing, breathing, focusing on the here and now. I hope that you maybe feel a little, maybe a little calmer, a little bit more relaxed. And that's just a tiny taster of, of living life more mindfully. And of course, there's lots, I should say, under each of these keys, uh, whilst the headlines are simple, Underneath them are lots and lots and lots of evidence-based ideas for action that you can try. But it's quite interesting to say that we can see that we can make a meaningful, a little change in our state just in a few moments. Let's try another one. Can we get the next slide up, please? So emotions. Um, this is the E in dream. The acronym, I should say, for the 10 keys is great dream. Um, so the E in dream is emotions and look for what's good. So now reflect on your day yesterday um, and think about something that comes to your mind um, that was good, something that you enjoyed, were pleased about or grateful. And it might be a tiny thing. It might be that today, yesterday was really stressful and you, you know, it was just, yeah, you, know, you took a couple of moments to sit down with a cup of tea or you had a lovely message from a friend, whatever it is, a tiny moment. And just reflect on that for you know, what was it that you enjoyed about that? And now notice what that makes you feel, how that makes you feel. Um, and again, a little bit, maybe a tiny, tiny change in, your, in how you felt, maybe a little sort of warm, felt good, maybe a little tiny bit um, of joy, whatever it is. Now, these moments of fleeting moments of, you know, positive emotions or pleasant emotions, there's lots of different ones, have been shown they're not just a nice to have. They've been shown to have both a psychological and a physiological effect. So when we're in a pleasant emotional state, um, we literally see more, we're more open eyed to ideas, we're more open to other people. We're better at creative problem solving. That's great for learning. It's also great for our our well-being and our resilience. So we're just, and there's lots of different ways we can foster these positive emotions, but there's just some, you know, within the science of happiness, there's both these short, tiny things that we can do and also bigger, deeper things. But just to give you a little taster, could we get the next slide, please? Um, I want to highlight that in the great dream, in the 10 keys, two of the keys, in fact, the first two keys are giving and relating. And these are actually all about other people. They're about our connections with other people because we're social creatures. And we know that not only do happier people, as I said early, um, help others more, but actually helping and contributing to others takes our mind off our own worries and can actually show to activate the reward centers in our own brain. So it's a great strategy for not only helping ourselves be happier, but helping other people be happier. Could we move on to two, two, uh, two more slides, please? Next one, thank you. So I want you to do a quick reflection right now. Just a very quick reflection. So the first five keys are giving and relating. So helping other people, being kind to others, nurturing our connections with others, lots of different ways the psychology shows we can do that. 
taking care of our bodies is the E. So that's both moving our bodies, exercising, getting enough sleep, uh, very important, eating well, getting daylight, awareness and all the different ways we can live life mindfully and trying out, learning new things, which is great to be talking at a university about that, constantly having new experiences, which is great for our creativity and great to keep our brains active. Just take a moment to reflect. What do you do currently to invest in your well-being? And I, you know, I encourage people to see these things as investments in their well-being, investments in your sustainability, if you like. So this is a quite a nice way to use the 10 keys. So let's let's I just want to highlight now, just in the, the last few minutes, a couple of the keys in the dream section, the more inner section. So if we could then move on to the next slide. Um, the next slide, please. And Professor Mushtaq touched on this, but I think it's really important if we're thinking about what does it mean to live a happier life? Notice I say happier living and I call the 10 happier life and I call the 10 keys, the 10 keys to happier living, not the 10 keys to happiness. Because if we expect life, you know, that we kind of learn these skills and then we're going to be, you know, up there, happy, smiley for the rest of our life, then that's unrealistic because everybody's life has ups and downs. There's things that we can't control, things that happen in the world or in our families, um, you know, even inside ourselves that, you know, that you know, sometimes cause us to be unhappy. But so being living a happier life means actually accepting some of those things will happen, but having the tools and skills to help us deal with those in as constructive a way as possible. So can we move on to the next next slide, please? So it's really we the, the R in dream is all about resilience and finding ways to bounce back, particularly our habits and practices of thinking. So Albert Ellis, who was a grandfather uh, of cognitive behavioural therapy, said as human beings, we're remarkably good at disturbing ourselves by the way we think. Um, so there are lots of different practices that we can do to build our resilience. And I know Sulin is going to be talking shortly um, about uh, managing stress. So but. It's important to highlight here that whilst we have a key of resilience, particularly focused on thinking, all the keys to happier living are in fact keys to resilience as well. So you can go to the next slide, please. And I also want to highlight this because I know that in for people who are kind of really want to do their best and achieve well, which I'm sure is true of all the um, Harriet work students, is how we treat ourselves, how we what we focus on in ourselves is really, really important. Because even people who are kind of done, you know, got the best grades, and um, done really well um, in all aspects of their lives, can actually be really tough on themselves. So acceptance is all about self-acceptance and being comfortable with who we are. It's about focusing on our strengths as well as our weaknesses, but also thinking about that inner voice in our head. Do we actually have an inner critic or an inner coach? And if we have an inner critic, which is kind of starts to activate the threat systems in our brain, um, how do we turn that into an inner coach that can help us be our best? So that's what the key of acceptance is all about. So can we go to the next key, the next slide, please? So I've, we've just highlighted two or three of the, well, more than two or three, um, I should be able to count, um, of the 10 keys to happier living. It's a little flavor. There is a lot that you can dig into. I know there's loads around campus um that people can dig into there's the book and there's all sorts of resources on the action for happiness website but it's as i said it's a kind of toolkit if you like it's areas that where the science shows that you can make most difference can we flick on to the next slide please but what the science shows is that small actions repeated over time can make a big difference in your life and in other people's lives can we flick on, please? So our action for happiness is often how we end our sessions, is the world is changed by your example, not your opinion. So these, the clues in the name, action for happiness. So think about after today, you're going to be hearing some fantastic sessions. Think about, next slide, please. Next slide, please. What action can you take to invest in your own well-being and perhaps contribute to the well-being and, and happiness of others. So if you want to find out more, next slide, please.
Um, there's the book, which I know is I'm very honoured that that's being given as a prize. Very practical handbook, but it's also got the science that you can dip into if you want to. Next slide, please. There's a children's book if you're interested, based on the ten keys, but apparently young children, seven to eleven year olds, um, like big numbers. So it's got um, 50 ways to feel happy, cuddling five for each key. Next, so and if you're interested, International Day of Happiness. Um, there's a 10 um, free a little mini coaching program called the 10 um, Days of Happiness, which you can sign up for. Um, uh, it's free and great if you could get the, you get all the students around campus trying that and, and, and friends and family at home. So next slide, please. Next slide. And also we have these lovely Action for Happiness calendars that are based on the 10 keys. So each month there's a free calendar to download and it's they're translated into about 25 different languages as well by volunteers. We're in Mindful March. Um, this month, next month is Active April. So this is the key of awareness. Next month is the key of exercising and taking care of our body. We've just finished Friendly February. So that's it from me. So thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be here in a, um, in a turbo tour of the 10 keys. I hope you have a fantastic rest of the session and um, look forward to answering some questions shortly. Thank you. Been to Harriet Watt University, Malaysia. We actually have Yankees to have giving and the great bin posters all around the university. And I must say that it has it has helped me so much on my more stressful days in uni. Now, once again, I would like to remind you that you can type in your questions for our speakers in the chat box for our QA session later. Now, speaking of stress, what do you think about stress? Certainly not a very pleasant experience, is it? Well, our next speaker is a colleague of Vanessa's, Su Lin Chung. Her lifelong passion is to help people find meaning and fulfillment at work and in everyday life. She is a certified professional coach and is really at her best telling stories and sharing experiences. So I'm very much looking forward to her insights on beating stress. Su Lin, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Happiness Forum. This is one of my favorite days in the world. And Vanessa, it's so great to see you here. OK, so let's get on with this. I have got like 10 minutes to help you handle stress that you've tried, we've been trying to figure out for most of your life. So let's get on to this. What is stress? So we talk about beating stress. To beat an enemy, we need to figure out the enemy. So what is stress? Stress is our response to changes around us. So let me teach you a little bit of brain science. In your brain, there's a little kidney bean size thingy that's in the middle of the head in between these two points. It's called the amygdala. Sometimes when we freak out, it's called amygdala hijack. Why does that happen? That little kidney bean in your head is the evaluator of all changes around you to figure out whether it is a danger or a threat to what's um, happening in your life. So in, in caveman days, that was easy, right? So when the amygdala decides it is something worth paying attention to, it sends out stress hormones that evokes emotional responses that are either fear or anxiety that makes you run away, that's flight, or makes you angry. How dare you? How dare you intrude? How dare you come across me? That's anger and aggression. And in those old days, in, in prehistoric times, it was about between the dinosaur who makes you food or the rabbit who becomes your food. Now that was easy. Now fast forward to what we are facing today. Today we are in this pandemic, a pandemic that started uh, in Malaysia at least, uh, where a lockdown was actually imposed on March 18, exactly a year ago. At that point, stress levels, I think, must have shot real high. So what is stress? In our current life, stress, our stress response is not to dinosaurs or, or rabbits. Uh, we are not hunters. Our stress responses are to our bosses. Our stress responses are to our kids 
All right, our stress response is, oh my goodness, you mean I need to be a work from home parent, become a teacher to my, stu my, my children who are studying online, plus cook the meals, because my mate went on holiday and can't come back because of the pandemic, and so on and so forth. So can you imagine that red bean in your head is being triggered over and over and over again. It's like the little kid in the lift, the elevator going upstairs. The lift is not moving and he keeps pressing the button as if it would go faster. And that's what's happening in your head. So can you imagine what's happening? And, and what you are then feeling is, I can't eat, I can't sleep, I'm so stressed, or I eat too much and I sleep too much, I am so stressed. And you feel pain, you feel tension, you feel lethargy, you feel helpless, all mixed together. Now that is not all bad, all right? That is not all bad, but it becomes bad when it's chronic. Now I would say a year of pandemic makes it chronic. If you are still fussing over the fact that you are under lockdown and having to practice SOPs and study at home and teach online and stuff like that. So I want to take two minutes on why we do not want chronic stress in our lives. It causes systemic damage to us, in us. Mental health problems, physical health problems, social relationships, longevity, which means how long you live, which means it kind of really, really um, damages not only how long you live, it has an impact on how long you live, it has an impact on how well you live. Now, do you have good news, Sulin? Yes, I have. All right. Now, what we are suffering is called distress. Distress is stress that we do not want. But some people seem to have glided through the pandemic quite easily. Now, I, I am one of those and I freak other people out like, how can you not be stressed? I say, I am not stressed. There are things happening and I just deal with it. So I'm going to share with you my secret. Now, what the press doesn't tell you is distress has a twin brother. Now that brother's name is eustress, E-U-S-T-R-E-S-S. -E eustress means happy stress, positive stress, right? When Nisa talks about growing, talks about resilience. Eustress builds resilience in us. Eustress motivates us to do that one thing better. I have never taught online, but you know what? This is a new skill that I can pick up. Maybe there will never be a pandemic again, but you know what? Now I can teach online. Isn't that great? When I'm sick, I can still run a class. When there's a flood in my area, I can still run a class, right? Um, use stress actually, when we look at something and we, 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 we turn our thinking, like Vanessa says, change your thinking, change your thoughts, change your life. We grow. We are willing to learn. We're willing to reach out to other people for help. We're willing to collaborate. And this is the stuff that stories of our lives are made of. When we talk about people who, be, who went from zero to hero, this is the stuff that people are talking about. So how do we make that happen? So let me share with you my little secret. OK, so in life, when something happens, first thing, do you have control? Check it out. Do I have control over the pandemic? Uh, uh, no, I'm not God, right? I'm not doctor, I'm not anything. But what do I have control over? I have control over how I spend my days at home. I have control over how I connect with people. I have control over what I eat, how, when I sleep. I have control over my emotions. I have control over a lot of things. Now, some people say, I am like that. What can I do about it? No, you are not like that, my dear. You are not like that. You do have a choice in life. So the next step is choice. So you change your thinking about whatever threat or danger or things that disrupt your, your comfort. And you have a choice. You have a choice in the outcome. Do I want to score A's? because of the pandemic or do I want to fail because I am so upset that I can't relate with my friends, I, I can't understand my teacher, 
and give all that kind of excuse or do I want to be an A star student? I am going to email my my, te my, my tutor. I am going to stay so connected. I am going to ask so many questions and since I can't see my friends, I, I you know, I will do whatever it is. So we have a choice. Teachers, parents, we have a choice. Yeah, we are more mature. We have a choice in how we manage our time. Do we have to cook every meal? No, I'm not going to go into it, but I I live alone and I actually do meal prep. I cook for a whole week. My freezer is like a takeout. I just go there and decide what I want to eat for today. You can do that. Come on, there's a lot of things you can do. So first step, control. Decide what you have control over, what you don't have control over. Don't waste your life freaking out about things you can't control. Choose the bits that you can. You don't eat an elephant in one bite, you eat it bite by bite. So let's go for it. Choice. How do you want this to end up? Right? All stories, all movies you go to have happy endings. Let's make the pandemic end happily where we all become stronger, better and smarter. So last but not least, change. Change the way you speak, change the way you think, change the way you feel, change your mindset, change your habits, change. If you don't change, the outcome does not change. Two plus two always equals four. You need to change the numbers or you need to change the plus or you change, need to change something to make the result different. So you have a choice. You can change your directions. You can change your goals. You can change your expectations. All right, so focus. When you live life intentionally, when you live life knowing what you want out of it, in any circumstance, you always end up a lot better. So my friends, I think we, I will leave your questions till the end, right? What I want to say now is you and I have a choice. We have a choice every minute, every day, every time something moves in our lives. Is there a good thing or a bad thing? It's not the question. Good thing, bad things, we don't know how they finish up. But what we have a choice about is how we respond to it, how we very quickly recognize which bits we can control, cannot, make a choice how we end this, want this to end up, and change whatever we need to, to get to that outcome that we're aiming for. So over to you, my friends. Good luck and I hope to see you on the other side. Thank you. Sue so, Lim, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. I think it's quite interesting to learn that stress does not always have to be a bad thing and that we can use you stress, which is positive stress to motivate and improve our own performance. On another personal note, I think I will certainly try and practice that skill. Once again, I would like to remind you, you can leave your questions in the chat as we move on to the first Q&A session for the day. Let us see some of the questions that you have submitted. So we have a question. The first question is for Vanessa. Do you think the pandemic has made governments more aware of the importance of happiness? Vanessa? Um, yes, I hope so. I hope so. Um, there's certainly been lots of evidence from the UK um, coming out about the levels of stress and anxiety that are caused by um, the pandemic. Um, and um, I think it's been made everybody a bit more aware of the need to invest in support for well-being, um, not just dealing with mental ill health issues, but dealing with um, building well, investing in building well-being as well. And I think the pandemic has made us all a bit more aware, perhaps, in terms of the need to take care of our psychological well-being. So, um, and it's the uh, the World Happiness Report is out today. Um, showing where the different countries are in the rankings on happiness and um, that um, I think more governments are starting to pay, pay attention to the stuff. New Zealand, for example, is um, measuring, has a very comprehensive well-being measure. So I think that's enough. To, I could talk about this for ages. <laughs> Uh, 
Thank you so much, Vanessa, for your answer. And now we have the second question for Su Lin. How could we help our nearest person to cope up with their stress events, especially while they have suicidal thoughts? Su Lin. Um, very simple. When someone has got suicidal thoughts, it is not for you and me to handle. We refer them to professionals, people who are trained to deal with it. Yeah, the best job we can do is to take this one, this person uh, or introduce this person for help. Because stress is subjective. It is something that you feel. You cannot help someone else feel. And, and when somebody is suicidal, that person has reached beyond his own coping skills. So he needs help, maybe medicine to calm him down for a while so that he can think. Right? Suicide is not something you play with. Suicide is not something for one, for you or for me to, to, to work with. Um, I, I work with counselors, I work with psychiatrists, I work with psychologists. we have for the first Q&A session of today. I would once again like to thank Vanessa and Su Lin for their very inspiring and informative presentations. Unfortunately also that will be the end of your time with me today as I will be passing the second part of our forum to our second MC for the day, the ever wonderful Hani. Thank you Faraj for that lovely introduction. Salute and good day. I'm Hani Elena Harris, and I'm delighted to be your MC for the second part of the forum. I'm quite excited to introduce our next speaker. His name is Mr. Syed Abdul Rahman. He holds many roles, including the advisor for National Dive Council and DC Malaysia under the Ministry of Tourism and Culture. He is truly committed in sharing his passion for diving with the disadvantaged communities through Dive Heart Malaysia with the motto, imagine the possibilities. Take away. Hi everyone, uh, good evening. Thank you very much for the period award for inviting me for this program. Um, let me share with you a little bit about uh, the history about Dive Heart. Uh, Dive Heart was uh, launched in Chicago in year 2000 um, there with the uh, headquarters in Downs Grove. Uh, we in Dive Heart in Malaysia, we have recently started Dive Heart Kids in Malaysia, whereby we share the uh, water possibility and also the water environment with kids uh, such as the uh, Down syndrome kids, autism kids, and also uh, the uh, special ADHD kids. Uh, all right, okay, so um, this is about Dive Heart. And uh, we in Malaysia, we have uh, uh, conducted our Dive Heart program way back about five uh, years ago, in which uh, we have launched Dive Heart uh, to give opportunities to the special community uh, to share the water environment uh, that they might not think that they could do it. So this, with regards to the forum, has given a lot of happiness into this uh, community in which they have actually thought uh, that they could do something beyond their imagination. It is in line with the Dive Heart tagline, which is imagine the possibilities. Uh, here we have um, the uh, Dive Heart president, Mr. Jim Elliott. Uh, he is uh, online now uh, in the slide. As you can see, um, we have done quite a number of programs of uh, dive heart programs in the beautiful Malaysian uh, Marine Park Islands. Uh, initially, uh, from the slide that you can see was a dive, our dive heart program in Min People and Tian Resort. And also, uh, we have uh, done a, quite a number of dive heart programs on the islands of Tioman, on the islands of Perintian, Bidong Island with University of Malaysia Tunggano, Marble Island, Sabah with Bona Divers, Sipadan Island, 
We do have our dive heart training center at the Tropicana Kajang Heights Recreational Hub Swimming Pool. And not forgetting our branch uh, across the South uh, China Sea with Dive Heart Borneo, which is, uh, have done uh, quite a number of programs in Kuching, Sarawak. Uh, here, I would like to share with you some of our Dive Heart Adaptive Program with uh, BNJ Dive Center. We have done uh, a few programs with uh, special uh, community in which before this, they were normal. And then they had a bad accident. Uh, of course, during the accident, they are depressed. And when they came to us, recommended by the um, specialist doctor from uh, University of Malaya Medical Center, which they, they undergo their therapy. And when we taught them that water can ease their pain, of course, it is a happiness environment to them. Uh, now, next is uh, where uh, I would like to share with you something that we have uh, done, which is Dive Heart Kids in Malaysia. Uh, we have done uh, a program with a Down syndrome, a very lovely young girl, Sabrina Theo. She's a Down syndrome girl, but she plays the violin and she can swim. So when she came to me and I said, uh, are you ready for scuba diving? She, she nods to me. She doesn't speak much, but when I show her the video and all this, then she starts smiling. And when I actually uh, showed her the video, uh, you know, the SOP with regards to diving, we got to brief her and show the video. She actually doesn't look so much into what uh, the video is and also my briefing. But in the water, when I start communicating with her with hand signals, she actually can communicate with me effectively underwater and she was smiling. So again, happiness is where the water environment is. So uh, besides that, we have also trained uh, children with regards to autism, non-verbal, uh, in which the water is a healing process. And I've seen a lot of um, uh, students in which uh, they were stressful on land. The moment we hit the water with the right procedure, with the right safety environment they will smile after after the program yeah uh, so here i'd like to share with you uh, on the slide uh, that we have done a few programs with university of malaysia Tranganu. Uh, if you can see the, the bottom right uh, photo is where i brief a special girl she is without hand and without limbs and um, the father actually uh, is a medical doctor with the University of Malaysia Tengganu. The father asked me, Sai, are you really sure that my daughter could do it? I said, yes. So we took her underwater. Of course, there's a lot of smile after the program. Uh, imagine the possibility. Yeah. So uh, this is our program that we've done uh, with University of Malaysia Tengganu. We brought a special dive heart team together with special uh, community of uh, spinal cord injury uh, team into the Pidong Island of University of Malaysia Tranganu. Um, during the uh, diving in Pidong Island, we uh, brought some of the uh, spinal cord injury patients from uh, University of Malaya Medical Center to do the uh, scuba diving, and they were very happy. Uh, here are some photos of some, one of my students, Nurul Fatiha. Now, I would like to share with you that she was normal before she had a bad accident in which it affected her spine. And she was on a recovery and rehabilitation mode uh, with her professors and doctors in the University of Malaya. She never thought that she could do sports again. After a long training of special, for special community, we normally train them for about two to three months. For normal people like you, I can train you up in four days. <laughs> For them, it'll take them months, you know. So here, you, as you can see, Nuru Fatiha, she's enjoying diving. She enjoys dive, and medically proven that uh, a dive for paraplegic, those who has gone through their spinal cord injury um, uh, experience, it reduces their neuropathic pain. This is proven with a medical journal from John, Ho John Hopkins University. You can check it out. And uh, normally after the, the dive, they are happy and they are smart. And here we have some news. Um, we were featured in uh, uh, the Scuba News UK. Uh, 
for our program. And here, another one is our program at Mingti Perhentian Resort, in which we brought in special hearing impact kits from the uh, Kola Pendidikan Khas in Kuala Besut. And the kids grew up in Kuala Besut. They have never been to the island. They've seen all tourists coming in and out. And when they went to the island, the first thing that they did was smile. That's happiness. This is our program that uh, we were featured in the national news. We were featured in uh, uh, TV Tiga Bulletin Utama. It's not easy to get into Bulletin Utama, but we were featured for three minutes and 48 seconds. Uh, here, I'd like to share something that I also had the opportunity with Thai Heart to train the Malaysian Parliamentary Senator. I would like to share with you and see whether you smile. This is when I get the politician underwater, yeah? <laughs> Uh, this is some of our program that we have done with some of my students and they are students from University of Malaya. Um, they enjoy the water environment uh, as normally, um, as I mentioned earlier, it reduces their neuropathic pain. Uh, these are some of the examples and I would like to share with you whenever we take a special community underwater, there's a special SOP that we like to have. Uh, it's not that we like to have, it's compulsory. For one uh, disabled person or special community, we need two or three dive buddies. One on the left, like my friend here, another one on my right for honey, another one is in front. All right. So this is for safety procedure. So we make sure that they are safe and most uh, importantly, that they enjoy. And uh, this is one of our uh, special uh, uh, community uh, diver. Uh, this is Riza Faisal. Uh, she, he uh, had an accident at the age of 18, a vehicle uh, accident, and it broke his spinal cord. He was sandwiched in the, in the van, and he had a, a depression for one or two years because he was uh, shy and scared to go out to see people because his friends was normal and he is no more normal. But after being recommended by his professor, to do scuba diving. His professor told, told him, you go and see Mr. Sai and get to see and get down in the water. And uh, in that video now, the slide that you see, uh, the bottom right hand slide, as you all of you can see that he's practically standing in the water. This is when Riza Faisal came back to me and said, uh, Abang Sai, I've never thought that I could stand again. Sorry, very emotional. No, that's so lovely. Yeah, Such so uh, he was very happy to be able to stand. He was in a wheelchair, he couldn't stand. But here, as you can see, underwater, he could stand back again. That is happiness that money cannot buy. Yeah, so uh, again, uh, with Riza Faisal, we brought him far out because he's a dedicated diver. We brought him to the, the top five dive destination in the world, Sipadan Island. And he's, as you can see there, he was diving with, you know, uh, hundreds of fish. He was enjoying the dive. And um, this is what uh, happiness is all about. Uh, we would like to share with you that with Dive Heart program in Malaysia, we were also featured uh, in international news. Uh, I was uh, invited uh, to present Dive Heart Malaysia in Dima, in Orlando, Florida, and we were happy to mention that we were featured in ABC 7 News, ABC 8 News, Fox 40 News, and also Travel Wire News. This is truly a recognition for our program that we have done in Malaysia. Um, are we still on? Yes? Okay. Uh, next, we were also, I was very happy that we were also featured in uh, San Diego FM News. Uh, this is something uh, very uh, special for a dive art program in Malaysia to be presented on an international media coverage. Yeah, uh, besides that, we were also uh, uh, covered uh, and uh, promoted widely uh, over our, our diving friends internationally, as you can see. We were presented in X-ray Mac Dive Denmark. We were presented in Emirates Diving Association in Dubai. 
and also uh, not forgetting our friends in Australia, we have we were presented in Thai Flock Australia magazine. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Syed. That was so very heartwarming. Um, also, since we've heard about um, Dive Heart going on media, um, I think we're going to show a short clip okay. on all the wonderful things Dive Heart has done. change the lives of many young people by turning their dreams definitely into a reality. Now, we are going to bring the top, the notch up one level and switch gears with the speakers from our very own Harriet Watt University. Harriet Watt University has a beautiful global reach, providing an amazing diverse community that supports one another regardless of adversity. So today, giving a perspective on facilitating the transition into university, we have our homegrown expert, Prof. Deborah Hall, Malaysia's first positive psychology professor, who now heads the Department of Psychology here in the Malaysia campus. Having worked in research for 25 years, 
I'm quite certain this is going to be an interesting one. Take it away, Deb. Thank you, Hanny. Do you mind if I stand up? No problem. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, well, welcome everybody and thanks for staying with us through part two of our happiness forum. Um, I'm going to be talking about facilitating transitions from school into university. And I was doing open day last weekend for the university, talking with parents about um, opportunities here at Heriot Watt. They asked me lots of questions about career opportunities, what kind of psychology job was the most prestigious? What earns the most money? Now, while respect and income are important, it's well known that these alone don't guarantee happiness. And I'm sure Syed would agree with me when I say that. In this talk, what I'm going to do is offer you a different approach to guide your decisions about choices at university, because this is a really crucial time if you're making that transition step. Um, what I want to do is offer a more positive mindset with questions like, what are you interested in? What are you good at? What, um, and where might that lead you? After all, what we study at university is often a stepping stone to the profession that we choose for the rest of our life. So happiness, and what makes us happy is a really important consideration. Now, um, this is where I'd like to draw on the discipline of psychology called positive psychology, because it offers a fresh outlook onto this mindset. Now, it was established around 20 years ago in the US um, with a psychologist by the name of Professor Marty Seligman. And our previous speakers, Vanessa and Sue Lin, studied under Marty at his Centre of Positive Psychology. He really founded this movement and he recognised that good mental health is not simply just an absence of mental illness. It's much more than that. People don't just want to survive, they want to thrive and flourish. And Syed has shown us lots of inspirational stories of people doing just that through diving. Now, when we're flourishing, we're having rewarding and positive relationships. We're feeling confident and competent. And we believe that our meaning has purpose and it, um, it has a meaning um, in our life. So instead of focusing on avoiding the worst things in life, Positive psychology is looking at building um, the best qualities in life so that we can be resilient. We can bounce back from setbacks and we can face challenges and we can feel good in ourselves. So that's a little bit about the science. Now, research over the last 20 years shows that um, flourishing is not only valuable because it makes us feel good, but it has lots of real world benefits as well. And here's just a slide showing you some of those research findings. Compared to young people with low uh, well being, those young people with higher centers of well being, they do better at school, they have higher grades, low rates of truancy, less um, depression and anxiety. And Vanessa touched on many of these topics in her introductory talk in the first session. Now, we know now that flourishing protects us against poor mental health and it supports success. Well, how do we get there? Well, I'd like to introduce you to some of the concepts from positive psychology. And in this slide, we can see five enablers that help people flourish and get the most out of life. So I'm just going to walk you through these uh, five things. Let's start off with positive emotion. Now, when we're feeling good about ourselves, when we're feeling valued by our family and by our friends, then we're experiencing positive emotions. A good educational environment should also nurture positive emotions and um, positive emotions in our lives bring lots of health benefits. And we saw that in my previous slide from some of the research. The next one is engagement. Getting lost in something that's intellectually stimulating can also build new skills. If I think about um, what I like to engage in, I really like writing. I enjoy sitting at my computer. I can be there for hours and I've written an awful lot of journal articles and book chapters over my um, academic career. 
when I'm doing it, I get really engrossed. I just notice, don't notice the time it flies by. And sometimes my husband gets really exasperated because he can say something to me and I just don't hear what he's saying. I'm so engrossed in what I'm doing. That's what I'm talking about when I mean engagement. I'm sure you have some similar experiences. What do you enjoy doing that you can lose yourself in? And I can certainly tell what you're thinking in answer to that question. <laughs> 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 um, next, we're going to talk about relationships. Now, maintaining positive relationships is the most significant contributor to well-being and flourishing. A positive relationship can protect uh, well-being during what is potentially a stressful time. And I'm sure you'd all agree that the MCO has been pretty stressful for all of us. Um, if I draw on some of my own experiences, my family back in the UK, I have an elderly aunt and she's found it quite difficult to cope. She lives on her own and while she's got a network of friends, she's been quite cut off from seeing those friends as she's been living at home on her own. Um, she's been feeling really down and depressed and has spent some time in hospital. So every day I've tried to just send her a message, just kind of chit chat, regular things like photographs of everyday things, pictures of flowers, just things that I've noticed just to let her know that I care. And it's not just my aunt, everybody needs to feel connected. Um, relationships are particularly important for young people, especially when making career related decisions. It's a really important time in life. And parents and teachers can serve as vital sounding boards to consider different options and to talk about things in a very non-judgmental, open sort of way. So that's relationships. Next, I'm going to talk about meaning. Now, having a purpose is really fundamental to creating a life of happiness and fulfillment. One of our mottos at Harriet Watt is about having meaning and purpose because we know that's what makes life worth living. Personally, I count myself very fortunate that my own sense of purpose matches my role in life. It fits very well with what I find engaging. As an academic, I enjoy sharing my knowledge and my experience with my students. Now, just think about that question for yourself. What brings your life meaning? And are you following your passion? Finally, uh, out of these five, we have achievement. Now we know that achievements strengthen self-esteem and they boost self-confidence. When we achieve something, it makes us feel good and it makes us want to do more. I remember when I was offered this position at Harriet Watt, it was like an adrenaline rush. As Professor of Positive Psychology, I get the chance to share my experiences with so many young people. I mean, what a privilege, what an honour. Now, I wonder if you can think back to the last time you achieved something that you felt really proud of. Just relive that moment for a second. Think about how you feel. I'm sure it feels really good. I'm just going to sum up and to help us remember these five things, we've got the acronym PERMA. It stands for positive emotion, engagement, relationships, meaning and achievement. PERMA, just remember that. PERMA can support um, informed choices and enable us to make a positive transition from school to university life. We know that um, while having choices to make about our future path is a privilege, it can also be a burden. I mean, there's so many options in deciding what to do after school. Sometimes it can feel a little bit confusing or stressful. Now, message to mums and dads, please resist the urge to make decisions for your child at this point. Try and maintain an open, flexible mind and be curious to explore some of those options together. This is what we call really good teamwork, working as a family together. Now, here PERMA can help. It's a set of principles that guide practical things that you can do to support your child. Shifting the focus from narrow questions to like what are you going to do after school to teaching the importance of good decision making. Uh, this will not only help that immediate transition from school 
to university, but it will cultivate good decision making skills that will be with you for life. So here's an activity that you can try at home. It's called Watch Your Interests. And it helps you think about making future choices in a different way. Um, it's about having an active and constructive conversation about positive things in life. So instead of just having that narrow perspective and thinking about, well, maybe I hope that you might do uh, this, like be a lawyer or an accountant or an engineer when you finish school, because it comes with lots of respect and you're going to earn a lot of money. What I'd like to encourage you to do is to ask yourself this question. So what are you interested in? What are you good at? Let's see where um, this leads you. And you can do that by just thinking about these two prompts. So firstly, what interests you? So if you're a parent or if you're a teacher, you can encourage your students to make a list of what activities they find more engaging. Um, what are the activities that they find really absorbing that they can lose themselves in? It can include academic interests, but you might also want to think about hobbies um, because creating space for engaging activities can, no matter what it is, can create a sense of well-being. And pay particular attention to those activities that invoke a sense of meaning or purpose in life. Next, while you're making a list, think about maybe what are the top three skills or top three personal traits that you're really good at, because these are your strengths and we should really build on, on our strengths. Um, these are traits that might inform your future career direction. For example, my own strengths, I think I'm good at critical thinking, I'm quite open minded, I'm enthusiastic, I'm um, optimistic and I'm curious. And I think all of these are quite good ingredients that are very fitting to life as an academic. So you can see how your strengths could lead you to a future career path and help you choose what sort of uh, subject to study at university. So I'm going to just leave you today with a summary of what I'd like you to take away from my um, presentation today. As much as anyone would like to ease their child's anxieties by offering an answer, um, please resist the urge to make decisions on behalf of your child. Instead, be inspired by PERMA. Have a conversation that watches your interests. If you've been inspired by this presentation, then next month we're launching a programme at Heriot Watt that will provide a supportive and guided space to enable parents and children to have this kind of conversation around this key transition point between school and university. I've put my contact details on the bottom, so if you're interested to know more, then please do contact me. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah, Thanks, for that lovely, insightful activity. I've got to agree with you there. I'm looking back uh, into my past experience in, here in Harriet Ward, it has definitely impacted the way I approach it. Like, just a quick note, we learned a new acronym today. It's called PERMA. Wonderful sets of principles. Just a gentle reminder, feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A section so we can get our speakers to answer them in the Q&A section. Now, coping online, flourishing online. That is the title of our next talk. I'm sure many of us are quite familiar with the challenges of online learning. And our final speaker, Prof. Martha Cadell, is pretty much had much to say on that. Martha is the Director of Learning and Teaching Academy at Harriet Watt University, Edinburgh, UK. Her role includes supporting all staff engaged in teaching and learning. So, whenever you're ready, Martha, Go ahead. Thank you so much and what an inspiring event and a wonderful balance of the big adventures that inspire us and the practical steps that we can take to, towards well-being and happiness. I'd like to continue that journey with a focus on our adventures in learning and teaching and particularly in online learning and what the experience of the last year means for your step into university study. 
I know that it's easy to focus on what you've lost this year, the time away from class, the clubs and activities you've missed out on, and the friends you might not have seen as often as you might have wished. But I'd like us to focus on what the pandemic has taught us. What, how it has equipped you with the skills to really flourish. So if we could have the next slide, please, that would be terrific. So I'd like us to see the pandemic as a portal, a gateway that we can step through together into something new. And through the talk, I'd like to give you a chance to reflect on your experience of online learning and working through this year. And I'd like you to think about how this experience will help you step into university study with confidence and the capability to truly flourish. And I'd like to share with you how universities like Harriet Watt are embedding care and well-being throughout their teaching and student support online and on campus. So this last year has allowed us all to gain new insights into learning. Students, I'm sure you've found new ways of connecting with your teachers and your classmates online. And most importantly, I hope you've found what really motivates you and keeps you enthused. Parents, homeschooling means that you will have gained very new and very different insight into what really inspires your children. The topics that really make their eyes light up and the activities that they thrive in. And fellow educators, you've had to adapt and develop your approaches at considerable pace and you've learned how to keep your class connected and working together in very challenging situations. Globally, this effort of teachers is truly appreciated and deserves to be applauded. But through all of this, collectively, we've learned that our key focus isn't on the technology, but on the people the personal support and the communities that keep us inspired in our learning and really allow us to flourish. There's been extensive research that highlights the way that student well-being impacts on their learning and that how students are taught and assessed in turn impacts on their mental health. This is especially important for online learning. Educators need to take practical steps and make everyday efforts to put well-being at the heart of student learning. Kindness and compassion is not just in words, but in very practical action. Action to create a curriculum that contains an appropriate level of challenge to build your confidence. Action to design learning activities that focus on collaboration and active engagement and action to assess students in ways that support their learning and build confidence. We need to create a mosaic of well-being that supports learning, a network of support that connects students with their peers, with their teaching teams, with dedicated university well-being support and their personal tutors. A mosaic that practically helps students feel they really belong within a course, within your campus and across the whole global learning community. So I wanted to let, give a little bit of information about the responsive blended learning approach that Harriet Watt developed this year. We drew on extensive pedagogic research and turned this into a practical model to support students to flourish in their studies online and on campus. We focused on carefully planned academic support so students know what to do and when to do it, but also why they're doing it and how to apply that learning in ways that are really meaningful to them. That sense of purpose that Deborah was talking about. And we focused on developing skills for learning. So and we supported that with our, the work of our effective learning advisors and with the personal tutors who engaging with each individual student. And we sought to create a community of care. Keeping connected has been a real source of support for students and for staff through live sessions, but also in those offline interactions, discussions and collaborative learning activities. And this has enabled students to keep building friendships and networks, even when campuses were closed.
And of course, with international travel restrictions, connecting students in our online global classrooms have been a vital so source of enrichment and inspiration, bringing together students across all of our campuses to share their learning. Oops. Apologies, I'll just go back. So most importantly, we focused on keeping learning active. We know that online and blended learning must be more than watching recorded lectures and studying alone. Learning is not a spectator sport. It's about building, it's about designing, it's about investigating, discussing and creating. It's about the learner sharing their passion for their subject and being given space to be inspired and to inspire others. So we've really driven active learning across our curriculum, including creative approaches to fieldwork, labs and studio work that can be engaged with online and at a distance. And I've personally seen the effort and the passion of our Harriet Watt colleagues that have put in to, to achieve this. And I know that that commitment is echoed out in schools and campuses across the globe as educators have helped students to flourish online. So I've spoken about a mosaic of what care, well-being and learning that's key to successful online study. So I'd like to think now about how you can build a personal mosaic, a personal network of skills and support that will help you through your next stage of your learning. So at this gateway to a new stage of your study, what support are you going to draw on? So here's a challenge to all of you, students, families, educators. I'd really like you to take some time after this session to, first of all, note down who or what has really helped you over the last year to cope with the challenge and change. What communities really mattered to you? What skills did you develop along the way? And what did you value about the experience of online learning? Then I'd like you to map out the topics or activities, the approaches to study that really inspired you. What made you sit up and take notice or even better, take action? And finally, look at this picture of support and inspiration you've developed. What will you hold on to? What ways of working or studying do you want to keep doing beyond the pandemic, beyond the lockdown learning that we have been engaged in? These might be small things, keeping organised in your study calendar or keeping connected to a particular club or, or activity, or it might encompass bigger decisions, the subjects that have inspired you this year, the ambitions that you've developed, maybe even a desire to travel and connect beyond your local community. So let me conclude with five top tips for flourishing as you step into university and continue your studies online or on campus. First of all, focus on what this past year has taught you, the skills and the confidence that you've gained and the challenges you've overcome. And these really do outweigh any missed classes, labs or exams. Secondly, be an active participant in your learning. Don't just turn up and listen, plan and prepare for sessions. Think and reflect, apply your learning to the world around you. Thirdly, focus on people, not technology, and really value the communities that you're part of. Stay connected with your study community, but also with the groups that help you switch off from study and flourish in other aspects of your life. And fourthly, share what you're passionate about. If you've been in a fantastic class, tell your friends about what's inspired you from it. That'll help you connect with others and will help keep you motivated to explore more. And finally, and most importantly, be confident as you take the next step in your learning journey. Be confident in yourself and the skills that you've gained this year and be confident in the support that your university will be able to offer. We really do understand what it takes to create inspiring learning online and on campus. And we understand what it takes to really help you flourish in the ways that you want to. So 
draw on your experience of this past year, appreciate what you've gained from it and step through to university with confidence. Thank you very much. Martha, you're an inspiring teacher. As a student in Harriet Watt University, I find it very reassuring to know that the Harriet Watt community is fully committed to making online learning a fun, engaging experience, despite the impact of COVID-19 that has brought tremendous uh, impact on all of us. One could even call this a resilient institution. Okay. Before we start the Q&A session, we got to hear Syed spoke wonderfully on transforming lives with Dipart Malaysia. Deborah spoke wonderfully about facilitating the transition into university and how this transition can be a positive one. And lastly, Martha provided wonderful tips on how to not only cope with online learning, but for a conducive learning experience. Now, I hope our speakers are geared up because we've got fantastic questions in mind. So the first question is for Mr. Syed. How to create boundary to avoid oneself from drowning negative in, in sorry, from negative emotion from outside? All right. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. That's a trick question. <laughs> first and foremost, uh, uh, with regards to the uh, forum and with regards to the question, uh, it also involved, to me, it involved the positive vibe that has to come in with regards to not to drown yourself. Uh, I do not know whether the question involved drowning in the water or drowning <laughs> on land. So there's two uh, areas, but my, my our professionalism is to the water environment. <laughs> So even before um, uh, in the water environment, we normally during our training, we 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 feed in a positive uh, enforcement and also positive uh, environment to each individuals, be it a child, be it a teenager, youth, and also adults, uh, and ensuring uh, with the tagline of Die Hard, imagine mm -hmm. the possibility. Well done. I think that's. Thank you up. so much. Yeah. So remember guys, positive reaffirmation, yeah? Okay, second question is for you, Deborah. What should one do when they have lost interest in things that they used to be excited about? Oh. <laughs> well, that, that's, a, that's a really good question. And actually, if you think back to PERMA, engaging is one of the key ingredients for achieving well-being. Um, I think during COVID, we should all take a pause for reflection and although it may be a cause of stress and anxiety just think it really is a time to re-engage with those things that we really used to enjoy doing and just being focused to just try picking them up picking them up again um, I've certainly tried to use this as an opportunity to take up sewing again, which I haven't done since I was a youth Okay. But um, it's kept me busy while I'm feeling sorry. Okay, thank you very much, Deborah, for that. Um, so, technically, the other word here is read up on Perma, yeah? <laughs> the next and last question we have for Martha. Dear Martha, do you think online learning requires more motivation? Take it away, Martha. I think it certainly can because I think the motivation it, it becomes more obvious. Um, a lot of the challenges of learning become more obvious in the online space. Um, and so that's why we work really hard uh, when we're designing for online learning to structure your learning and to help guide you through what you need to be doing at what point. So it can be, it can need a little bit more motivation, particularly if you're studying at a distance. And that's why we really focus on building community and helping support you so you don't feel alone. So distance learning, online learning doesn't have to be lonely. It is absolutely about being part of a community and feeling supported and helping keeping your, your motivation going. So it can feel like that, but there's a lot of support out there to help you keep your motivation going.
Brilliant answer, Martha. Thank you so much for that. Oh, well, look at the time. It looks like that will be the end of the Q&A session. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Syed. And thank you, Martha, for sharing your wonderful stories and inspiring us all. I like, I'd like to take the opportunity to also thank you, members of the audience, for participating with us. Now, I remind you being happy, we've talked about being happy a lot, <laughs> and it's International Day of Happiness, but being happy is not just for one day of the year, it's for every day of the year. Yep. And I hope you all take away some helpful tips that will help you lead a positive life, not just today, but tomorrow, the day after, and in the future. So we're really grateful for you all to join us and stay safe, stay hopeful and stay smart. OK, with that, we have concluded Harry Watt University's Global Happiness Forum 2021 in conjunction of the International Day of Happiness. On behalf of Harry Watt University, we hope you had fun with us. It's really been a pleasure hosting this forum. So. Farewell, selamat tinggal. Thank you, terima kasih. And have a wonderful weekend. Bye. Bye.